Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. And uh, this morning, uh, I really want to talk to you guys about weapons of warfare. And so I was praying, and I'm like, Lord, what in the world do we go next? And that's exactly, uh, I felt like the Lord was putting a verse upon my heart. And so I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask, are you ready? That's good stuff. That's good stuff. When I say, are you ready, I'm saying, are you prepared? And that's exactly the direction that I want to give you guys today, the scripture that goes along with that. Uh, As you guys know, um, first of all, uh, thank you guys. Thank you to the youth, uh, the people on the cameras. Uh, Thank you to the singers. You guys did a great job. And even Nikki and Sierra. The thing about Nikki and Sierra is that last night we had some cancellations, and I'm like, hey, who can do these roles? And the girls are like, yeah, we can do it. And they took away pride. And what I thought was super cool about Sierra was I'm like, hey, what, what are you going to do for call to worship? And she's like, I want to do Romans 12 too. And I'm like, hey, that is perfect. I was planning on using that verse in my message this morning. So it's kind of like a confirmation to me. Uh, so I'm excited just to be able to share with you guys this morning. Uh, but what I want to talk to you guys, again, it's just being prepared Um, especially for what's to come. So the past few weeks, we've been talking about the churches of Revelation. And uh, when we look at the different seven churches, oftentimes it came with correction, right? Either encouragement or correction. Now, how many of you guys love correction? Nobody, right? (laughs) Oftentimes when we have correction, we should use it uh, for the good. Now, do we respond that way? No, but we should uh, take a step back and reflect. It should inspire us to either change or keep doing those things, especially if we're complimented. And so that was exactly what was happening to the different churches. Uh, for each of us, just like the churches of Revelation, it should inspire us to reflect upon our relationship with Christ. And so when we look at the different churches, it was to ultimately to point us back to Jesus. Whether it was good or bad, it was to put our eyes back upon Jesus. And so as Christ corrected the church, oftentimes he brought forth a a stern warning saying, hey, I I want you to check yourself, I guess before you wreck yourself, I don't know, (laughs) Uh, basically to challenge them, that was not in there, but uh, (laughs) basically it was a strong, stern warning and to return to what they once were, to have their eyes back upon Jesus. And it should have sparked something in the churches Just like even in our own life, no matter where we're at on our journey, we should always point our eyes back upon Jesus, right? Because we all have those highs and lows in our life. Uh, But as we learn from the churches, we should also apply it to our life. But here's the kicker. When I was thinking about this, uh, I'm like, what happens if the church sets our eyes back upon Jesus? What do you think the enemy is going to do? Oh, that's good. He's going to attack. Do you think he's going to sit on the couch and watch? No, right? He's going to wreak havoc. He's going to come after us with everything he's got. So uh, the Lord is putting on my heart to be prepared. So how are we going to be prepared? How can we be equipped? And so that's what I want to, uh, to focus on because ultimately the enemy doesn't want you to remember your first love. He doesn't want you to remember and have your eyes set upon Christ. He doesn't want to see you grow closer to the Lord. See, the enemy is real, and he's out to steal, kill, and destroy us. He doesn't want us to get closer to the Lord. And so when I'm looking at this, I'm like, uh, when I think about the devil, especially when I was younger, I thought he was like the one with the horns and the tail, right? Uh, The costume. But I was looking up some statistics, right? And this comes from... uh, the Barno poll research, and a lot of times they do different polls in the churches. And so I was kind of surprised by some of these statistics. Uh, so can you go to that one slide? There you go. Thank you. 60% of Americans say Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. Even among self-described born-again Christians, 46% say they deny Satan's existence. Now, We all should know that Satan is real, right? And he's there to pull us away. Uh, We have to come to that realization that if we believe that the Bible is true, raise your hand if you believe the Bible is true, and the Bible does mention Satan, then he's probably real, right? (laughs) 
uh, we should know that. But do you think the enemy is just going to sit there? No, he's wanting to attack us. Uh, so when our desire is to seek the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and spirit, we know that the enemy is going to try to pull us away from the Lord. The Lord, uh, so even though we're in this battle and the enemy's trying to come against us, God doesn't leave us unprepared. And I believe that he's given us some weapons and hopefully it'll be some, uh, uh, some encouragement as we prepare for battle. Uh, so we want to allow the spirit to move in our life and use the different weapons that he's given us. So my question is, what are the weapons to overcome the enemy? Hey, that's a great question. So let's talk about it. So uh, we're going to overcome the enemy by three different things. The blood of the lamb, the word of God, and the testimony of the believer. Those are three different strong points that I believe that we can use to overcome the enemy. So as we continue to grow in the Lord and be used by God, we should remember that the Lord didn't leave us empty-handed. But in fact, we should actually equip ourselves with these different weapons. Again, the blood of the Lamb, the Word of God, and the testimony of the believer. So let's look into that. So what are we equipped with? Let's check out Revelations 12, 11. That way I'm not making this stuff up. All right. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb, right? They conquered him being Satan, right? By the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. So point number one is we're going to conquer the enemy by the blood of the lamb. And this is good stuff. So what does it mean by the blood of the lamb? Uh, the blood of the lamb is essential to the gospel. It's our redeeming story. Without it, I don't believe that there would be no gospel, right? It's important. Without it, there would be no gospel. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 says this. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. So we know that the blood of Christ is what makes us spotless. It's redeemed us. Well, let's look into it a little more. Uh, the blood of the lamb comes back from the lamb of the Passover. Uh, it's when the Israelites were taken into Egypt, and God spoke to Moses, to Pharaoh, and said to him, hey, let my people go. And guess what Pharaoh said? Nah, not today, bro. Uh, you're not gonna let, I'm not going to let your people go. But Pharaoh did not follow through. And so because of that, plagues were sent upon all of Egypt. And when you start looking at the plagues, you can see uh, that it kind of showed that God's power is of over all these different Egyptian gods. Uh, so the plague, the last plague, would be the death of the firstborn male child. And so the Lord gave specific instructions for his people. What I want you to do is to sacrifice an unblemished, perfect lamb and put the blood over the doorposts. Whoa, all right. This signified the covenant with the Lord. It kind of distinguished them from all other people just by the blood of the spotless lamb. It signified the relationship with the Lord. Uh, so God made a perfect world, being good. He gave everybody free will. And so man chose disobedience, and now sin entered the world. And God, being holy, can't be in the presence of sin. And since everyone has sinned, uh, God sent his son Jesus to be that perfect lamb, to die on the cross for our sins. And so that kind of made the atonement for all of our sins. And so it kind of goes hand in hand on how he is uh, the perfect lamb, the, blo the blood of the lamb. And so he died upon the cross for our sins, and so now we can stand before God when we surrender to him. Romans 5, 9 says this, How much more then, since we've now been justified by the blood, will, uh, will we be saved, him, uh, saved through him from wrath? And so I love this just because we are justified by the blood. And so what I think is so cool about this verse is the word justified. How many of you guys are, uh, I wouldn't say nerds, but love to look into words. I don't know. I do. I like to st Oh, my bad. Thank you. Check. Check, check, check. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, 
So justified, I really love this word. If you want to highlight it, that would be great. It's a pretty cool word. The word justify has a specific purpose, but not just a specific purpose, but it also, when you start looking at it in Greek, it indicates that that action, which is being justified, took place at a specific time. So us being justified happened at a very particular time. Can anybody guess what that is? Perfect, yeah. That's uh, when Jesus died upon the cross. We became justified when Jesus died upon the cross. Thank you, Sean. (laughs) Yeah, so the basic meaning of the verb uh, justified is to proclaim that a person is without guilt. Or if the person is guilt, then someone other than the individual took on the condemnation and bore guilt. The guilt. So at that time, when the blood of Jesus ran out, we became justified. He took on the sin, guilt, and condemnation. And I don't know about you, but that's exciting. We should no longer have condemnation or guilt. But at that exact moment when the blood came out, that's when we became justified. Good stuff. Can I get an amen? Yeah, 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 that's it. (laughs) I love to talk. I don't know. (laughs) All right. (laughs) And this is what Jesus came in the world to do, to shed his blood, to satisfy the justice of God. Because he was God and also fully man, and it was not just human blood, but divine, it was like a supernatural cleansing for everyone. So Jesus justified you and I before God. And it's up to us to accept that free gift, but also we no longer have to deal with guilt and condemnation. So a lot of times... Uh, especially with our walk with the Lord, when we get super excited about God. How many of you guys have ever been uh, super excited about God, right? You get super excited with your relationship, you're diving in, and oftentimes that's when the enemy wants to pour guilt and condemnation upon us. So in those moments, we remember that we are justified from the sacrifice that Christ did for us. So when Jesus justified us, he paid the atonement. Atonement is the idea of covering, uh, to hide, but also covering someone, not charging someone with an offense or penalty. So we can't stand before God, but because we're justified, Jesus made that atonement for us. So we don't take that guilt and condemnation, but also the penalty. Uh, A long time ago, uh, my dad, uh, and still does it today, but he was like, his specialty, he's like, does everything, a lot of construction. But one thing he really does and specializes in tiling. And so uh, I remember this one time I was in uh, college and he's like, hey, son, would you like to come with me to do a tiling job? And I'm like, yeah, I want to spend time with you, dad. Uh, Let's go. And so um, we were in this neighborhood that 750 to a million dollar houses, and I don't even know how he got this job, but he did. <laughs> uh, like, my dad's very skilled, but I'm like, how in the world do you got these connections to get your name out there? And so I'm like, yeah, I'll help. And so here I am, I'm cutting tiles. So he'd be like, here's all the dimensions I'm cutting. I'm like, yeah, this looks great. We get done with the job, and uh, my dad was like, hey, son, I want to thank you. Uh, can you go ahead and start loading up the truck? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And so The lady, the owner, came and started talking to my dad. And uh, so we got done. We went home. I went back to college. And my dad went back to the lady's house because she was complaining of all my jagged cuts. Right? And so instead of uh, her coming harshing at me or my dad getting upset, uh, he took it on himself. And the lady said, all right, you need to redo all this, all these cuts. And so we had to rip it out and redo it. The same thing is true for you and I. Even though we might deserve it, Christ still died for us. So the enemy does everything in his power to pull you away from the Lord. And one of those ways, I believe, is he messes with our mind. It's that guilt and condemnation. So he wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to feel like condemnation to pull you away from the Lord. And so oftentimes when we're on top of the mountain, the enemy wants to throw back our past. But guess what? He's deceptive and clever. And so while he might pull you down by placing fear, doubt, and guilt over your life, 
we want to remember that the Lord has already won the battle. Can I get an amen? That's good stuff. Uh, Christ has already paid the price, and we no longer have to deal without condemnation. He's taken our place of guilt and shame. So we want to remind the enemy that he's defeated Christ. And we don't want to forget what Christ has done. Uh, it kind of boosts up our confidence, especially like if we're in battle. It kind of remember, makes us, helps us remember what Christ has done for us. So this past week, uh, I had the opportunity to speak at FCA. And so one question asked the students, like, who do you guys know who Jesus is? And I think there was one response. And so I'm like, all right, do you guys know why Jesus is important? No responses. And so finally, after talking with him, it was kind of like a, a time of remembrance because throughout this whole thing, at the very end, I'm like, hey, let's take a video. I want to see you guys talk to share the world on who Jesus is. And so check out this video. Christ is life so we can have eternal life. Woo! Perfect. <laughs> Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. For God so loved the world, he gave us Jesus. Oh, clever. Jesus gave us his life to go to heaven. All right, so I tried to block out faces, but uh, on my computer it looked great. This one, it's like halfway, so I don't know. Anyways, I thought that was super cool just because they were reminded on who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And I think oftentimes, especially when the enemy is coming against us, we got to remind ourselves. We're people. Uh, we get busy. We do different things. But we need to come back to our first love and remember what Christ did for us. So as we remember what Christ has done, uh, we're also equipped with the word of God. So imagine you're in battle. The enemy is attacking. How would you sh why would you show up with no weapons, right? One of the weapons we got is the word of God. So... We're going to look at that. Uh, again, so I looked up some more statistics, and again, these things are very surprising to me. Uh, but this was way back when, in 2016. But um, out of, I know, I know. But the key part is that they say these statistics keep decrease, or increasing every single year, which is even sadder. Um, but there was a study of 12,000 people. And so here's the question I have. How often, if ever, do you actually read the Bible, not including times when you're at church service or a church event? Yeah, that's a kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> uh, so it's really self-reflection. But in 2016, they said 27% of the Christians say never. 14% say less than once a year. Once a year. That's pretty high to me. Um, and uh, they say over time it's been increasing every single year. So more and more people are reading the word of God. I'm like, how in the world can we be equipped for battle against the enemy if we don't have the word of God? Uh, when we were at summer camp, uh, the speaker was telling us that uh, the current generation, I think it's Generation Z, I don't know, but it's the current uh, or whatever the current one is. Anyways, it said that uh, with the current generation, there is a 4% biblical worldview. 4%. And they say it's decreasing. And if that doesn't inspire you to start pouring in the next generation, I don't know what will, because slowly it's dying out. Let's just be real. People aren't believing in the enemy. People aren't reading the word. Um, so again, uh, over time, we're just starting to see a decrease so we have to be equipped, and we should bring our weapons to war. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirits, joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Here's what I love. God uses his word to see the sin and unbelief in our heart. But once he exposes it, then I believe it becomes our weapon. Because it says, hey, man, it's kind of like a reality check going on. Uh, it kind of says, okay, maybe I need to get uh, the Lord's exposing these things in my life, so maybe I need to start turning more to the Lord. It kind of pushes our trust back up in the Lord. The Word exposes our hearts and helps us to realize 
that we're broken and we ultimately need Jesus. So I believe when it starts exposing those things, it helps us put our eyes back upon the Lord. See, in the Word, we see God. Uh, we see God. We start to learn more about His character and learn about Him. But we also see how God sees us. It enables us to be honest with Him, to trust His will, and obey Him. So the Word is important because it definitely exposes things that helps us get on the right track with the Lord. I remember this one time, uh, someone very close to me and my family approached my wife and was like, hey, how in the world do I get closer to the Lord? Uh, how do I start? And so uh, my wife was like, Alexa, she just left with the babies. Uh, but uh, she's like, you know what? Let me tell you, what you can do is start a Bible reading plan. Now I know that there is a Bible reading plan, especially with scripture verses, right? Once a day. Uh, so that's a great way to start. Just start picking out one verse and then maybe even reading the whole chapter. And so my wife was like, hey, start a writing Bible reading plan, but let me tell you how I started. Uh, so her grandparents, can you show that picture? Yeah, yeah. So her grandparents, um, when they took her in, was like, here, I want to show you uh, a daily bread box. And the daily bread box basically had verses of one a day, as you can see. And uh, basically... She would draw one out and start reading the whole chapter. So I thought it was super cool. And so she gave it to my uh, sister, right, to get uh, her relationship back on track with the Lord. Uh, so we can see that the word exposes us, but also gets us back on focus with the Lord. But it can also be used to attack the enemy. Uh, so after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, we see how Jesus used the word against the enemy. In Matthew and Luke, the tempter, the devil tempts Jesus. And so he actually told him, I want you to do three things. Create the bread out of stones to relieve his own hunger, to leap from a pinnacle and rely upon the angels to break his fall, and kneel before Satan in return for all the kingdoms of the world. And so as you read throughout various times, what I thought was quite interesting was oftentimes Satan used scripture that was out of context, Right? Kind of putting this uh, trick in, basically. Uh, he was basically trying to trick the Lord. And so that's why I believe it's important that we know the word, because we know that the enemy is deceptive, right? Uh, so we want to be able to read the word and apply it in the right way, because that's how Jesus responded with the word, but it was correctly. Uh, so Satan is deceptive and will do everything in his power to pull you away from the Lord. So it's important to know the word and also apply it to our life, especially in those low spots. Because again, in those low spots, that's when that guilt and condemnation and uh, the enemy is going to try to trick us. We don't want to be deceived. So every single one of us can be equipped with the word of God. Uh, how many of you guys have a Bible on hand? Yeah, good stuff. Uh, so every single one of us can be equipped with the word of God. Uh, we can apply the word daily. And when the world is against us and the enemy tries to deceive us, we'll be equipped to take him on. So we use the word to point us back to Jesus. Romans 12, 2 says this, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This is an awesome verse. Uh, to discern the will of God and to know what is good we have to renew our mind daily. That's why it's important to know the will of the Lord and setting our eyes back upon Jesus, especially in today's world, right? Uh, there's so much junk going on in the world. We need to be renewing our mind daily. Uh, so point number three is your testimony. Your testimony. So turn to your neighbor and say, what is your story? Perfect. Uh, what is the story of the miracle that he being Jesus has done in you? Every single one of us has a story, right? Uh, I don't care if you, don't, if you think it's not drastic enough. Guess what? Christ has saved you. He died for you. Again, you're being justified. He's redeemed you. That's a big story in itself that we should be telling everyone, right? Uh, the word of our testimony, our story, is how he's met us conquered us, washed us, changed us, and that's our testimony. 
our personal st- story of encountering the Lord, and we should be sharing that with everybody. And we each have one. Uh, and guess what? Satan cannot stand against your story, right? Because it's already happened to you, right? There's nothing he can do about it. <laughs> so why not go out and share it, especially how Christ has redeemed you? The power, why? Because the power and forgiveness and the love of our God, his son, is in our story and your experience and your encounter with Jesus. Uh, I often think about the woman at the well. Uh, so even though her past, Christ still loved her and she went out and told everyone. See, God loves us despite her past. He saved us and redeemed us. And now we get to share it with everyone. So as we look at this Samaritan woman, even though she had a rough sinful past, the Lord still reached out to her. So when she experienced the love and forgiveness of the the Lord, she went out, and what I loved about it, she went out and told the whole city. Come on, somebody. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if we went out and told our testimonies to all of Rochester? At least sharing how Jesus died for us. Come on. Uh, Every single one of us can do that. Uh, If we look at... uh, I think it's John 4. Is that the next verse? Can you go to the next verse? Oh, it's at the end. Okay. But anyways, now many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. Now, if somebody came up to you and told you everything, (laughs) I don't think we'd be too happy. But instead, she's like, hey, I know this guy is real. I know he's true. Uh, So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two more days. Many more believe because of what he said. And they, no long, they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we've heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. And what I really love about that is that there's a couple other verses in there that I didn't put up there, but it talks about how she went out and just told the whole city. And so to me, that's incredible. And so we can tell our story to the ends of the earth. You can start out with your family, to Rochester, to Indiana, throughout the whole world, right? There's always mission opportunities here, uh, and that's what I love about this church, right? Uh, But we can share our story with anybody. So every single one of us has a story on how Christ has changed our life. Whether you've had a rough past or not, Every single one of us falls short to the glory of God. But guess what? He's redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb, and that's our testimony. So go out and share how Christ has changed our life. So our our weapons, again, the blood of the Lamb, the Word of God, and our testimony. So as we make the commitment to turn our hearts back to the Lord, let's remember to be prepared. Uh, because the enemy is definitely going to attack us, especially if we're on fire and excited for God to use us. And as we get excited and closer to him. But we've been given the tools to fight the enemy. I feel like uh, the first one was kind of like our confidence. If you go into war and you don't have confidence, uh, you're probably not going to be able to withstand a lot. But we know that we can overcome guilt, fear, and pain because Christ paid the price, and that's the blood of the Lamb. We know the enemy's already been defeated, and Christ has already taken our place. And when the enemy reminds you of your past, guess what? You say, not today, I'm going to remind you of your future, right? Uh, Because he's already been defeated. So let's carry our sword, the word of God, and that's our weapon. Let's be in the word daily as the Lord searches our hearts and points us back to him. Let's know the truth when the enemy tries to deceive us. And the last one is, let's share our testimony. And I think oftentimes when we go into battle, we want to have reinforcements. We want the Calvary, right? We want as many people as possible. So let's go out and share our story, how Christ has redeemed us. The world needs to hear how Christ has redeemed you and how he's changed your life. See, I know that coming in the end of times, there's going to be a great falling away. So let's not be deceived. But remember... Revelations 12, 11, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. So I encourage you to go out and share your story with somebody and to be prepared. Uh, So as we close up, I would love to pray. So if you would bow your head, so, (laughs) my bad. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, God, uh, for just this morning, Lord. And so I thank you, Lord, for uh, waking us up, God, and turning our hearts back to you and to seek you out, Lord. And so I pray, Father, as uh, we're doing this, as we're seeking you out, getting closer to you, Lord, I pray, Father, that you just equip us and remind us of the weapons, remind us that the blood of the Lamb, that you have already conquered our sin and guilt and shame. And so I pray, Father, that uh, you remind us every single day, kind of like a, a phone call, that you're like uh, a reminder in our phone, just every single day to spend time with you, to be equipped, to stay in your word, so that we're able to overcome the enemy and not be deceived, Lord. And Lord, I also pray for bonus and courage over every single one in here, God. Lord, that we share our story on how you died for us and redeemed us. I pray that every single person in here feels valued, but more importantly, Lord, on how you've impacted us and redeemed us, God. Lord, we love and you. Thank you. In your name we pray.